Okay, welcome to class. Glad you found it. Hopefully there's not others still lost in the hallway somewhere. Um, I had to come in here because these force plates in the ground are not very portable. Um, they need a very solid concrete foundation, bolt receiving things to uh, bolt these down into. And uh, so you don't get much in terms of chairs in this room. You're welcome to sit on the floor if you want. You can be closer. We're mostly just going to be over on the treadmill for this. But I wanted you to see these so that as we go through this force chapter, you'll understand what force looks like in terms of the, the ground pushing back on a body. Or um, well, we'll do walking, jumping, and running, uh, a couple different speeds on that to show here's what force is all about so you can visualize it more than just seeing equations of F equals MA and just kind of accepting it. So hopefully this will be a good, valuable day to you. Um, when I first got these described to me, it was my advisor here at BYU told me they're, they're basically $10,000 bathroom scales. Uh, all they do is measure force, and you can get a bathroom scale and do that. You stand on the scale, it tells you um, 150 pounds. And uh, if you bounce on it, the digital ones might not work with that, but you might remember needle ones, you can see the force going up and down as you do different, uh, as you start stepping on it and as you are pushing off, the force changes. Uh, the nice thing on these is it constantly is sending the force. And uh, it's not like, I, I got annoyed with watching The Biggest Loser because of their scale that beeps around, <laughs> and finally it says what they're actually measured. These will tell you right, right away, uh, before you could even look at the screen. And it, it's sending out a voltage that represents the force constantly. So we have um, the computer receiving that voltage, and I guess it'll show on the screen, actually. Um, as I step on this one, you can see the red arrow there. Um, that's representing the force in, in live mode. So we know right away what the force is. That We have a graph window that we could have numbers to it also. But for now, just wanted you to see what it looks like there. And as I bounce up and down or accelerate up and down, then the force is going to be going up and down. When we have a force um, greater than body weight, like I've already got body weight here, but as I land from something, then I'm putting, there's the inertia of the body, all, everything getting pushed into the ground, larger forces, and it'll go above body weight. And then when I'm about to leave the ground, it's going to be a much lighter or lower amount of force that the ground is placing on the body. So we can measure that um, up to 100,000 measurements a second, which is way more than we need for human movement. We usually measure somewhere between about 1,000 and 2,000 measurements per second. Um, another thing you can get from the force plate is where on it you're located. Um, there's four sensors in this one. So as I step on one corner, you can see the corner of the force. If I'm over to the opposite corner, then we get that. So it knows what we call center of pressure, where the force is average that's being placed on whatever's on the force plate. So we get center of pressure, we get how large the vertical force is, and also, this is different than your bathroom scales. If I push sideways, it's a little slippery on the belt, but you can see there's an angle to that force. So it, it measures in two dimensions horizontal forces also. So that can be useful for things like um, when we're measuring walking, knowing the vertical force is good, but Horizontally, that tells us some things about friction, like we were talking about um, on Wednesday. So three-dimensional force with its magnitude and where it's originating from is where we get out of these plates. These ones we use mostly for uh, jumping and studies, including landings, things like that. When we want walking or running, we usually use the treadmill, which has uh, two force plates built into it. All right, so that's what the force plates are. They do cost a lot. Those ones, I think, were about 17,000 each. Uh, the treadmill here will go up to four-minute mile pace, and it can incline to 
I think it's a 25% grade. It might be a little higher than that. And you can put the belts in reverse. So you can go uphill or downhill when you have it inclined, which is pretty unique for a treadmill, uh, which means it costs a lot too, right? With the force plates built in and all that. Very strong motor. We had to get different electricity brought into the room. Um, when you're going downhill on a treadmill, most treadmills can't handle that kind of force. So they'll, they'll throttle the speed back, or they'll have a governor on it that doesn't let the treadmill go any faster than some whatever speed, depending on which one it is, because uh, downhill force is, is much larger, and it, and it would just kill the motors. This one, being more durable, can handle it. We can still go even four minute pace downhill, although I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> it's a little, um, we have a video that I haven't published of me catching Katie one time as she fell off the treadmill going downhill. Um, you remember that steeplechase water jump video of Katie Andrews? <laughs> it was that Katie. <laughs> she, <laughs> she also fell in here and we, we kind of landed back here and neither of us got hurt and we just laughed a lot, but decided not to post that one to ESPN. <laughs> so, um, all right, what was I on? The forces we're gonna measure today, we'll start with just jumping. I'm gonna give you a bit of application as we go with bone density and why we why might care about forces in running, jumping, and walking. And then we'll also look at, uh, specific to running, we'll look at some things about foot strike and um, how the forces on the body work with distance runners compared to sprinters and some other areas like that. So Parker's our volunteer for the day. Let's have you just stand. Um, let's do two jumps. First one, let's just have you uh, facing that direction with one foot on each of the belts. And I'll just call this jump number one. And it uh, doesn't need to be an all out vertical jump, but pretty good height. And then just try to land uh, and get steady again. Okay, ready, go. Okay, that's good. And then let's do one more where you're just on either plate. Doesn't matter which, whichever seems more comfortable. Okay, ready, go. Okay, very good. Um, you can go sit down again and we'll look at these forces. Uh, we'll get a, a graph window of what we're doing here too. So let's see. First, I need to open the right one. Let's first look at the one where he was just on one plate. So this is what vertical force looks like in jumping. Um, I'll just come point. Uh, it's displaying upside down from what you might expect. These are all negative values. So this is zero. And you remember the right hand rule from physics where they do this thing? This is Z, X, and Y, where, how the force plates are set. So the report we get shows negative, meaning there's more force pushing up on the body. But that's just how it displays. Right here would represent body weight. So, um, where's, where'd Parker go? Okay, um, here's a chair for someone in case <laughs> you don't like sitting on the ground and then I won't crash into it anymore. Um, you were around 570 on body weight probably when we measured it, so that's what it's getting you at here. Uh, 569.2, but notice there's little fluctuations. We're never like totally still, you cannot, stand completely still, and it'll just fluctuate around a few newtons or tenths of newtons. Then uh, Parker did the counter movement where you drop down first. You can't jump very high if you don't drop first. So force of the ground back onto the body got closer to, um, looks like around 150 or 200 newtons. If he has a weight of 570, and 
the force of the ground pushing back because of the movement drops down to 200, then we've got a pretty big acceleration downwards going on. Then at the low point starts pushing up and gets this large peak force um, right around 1600 something newtons um, at the, the peak there. Looks like one foot might have done things a little different than the other. You often see a little um, double bump at the end of those. And then here's zero. That's where he's in the flight time. And then here's landing, which got to just about 3,000 newtons. So how many times body weight is that? 3,000 over 570, uh, five or six times body weight. So a lot of force in landing there. Uh, let's do our first little bone density discussion with that idea. Um, when I did my grad school, I was working with someone named Christine Snow. The, um, she basically studies bone. That, that was her research interest. Uh, one of the most respected throughout the country and, and known internationally also. So I learned a lot from her. One of the things was what prescription of exercise seems to work for building bone density. And uh, there were studies currently going on, which is some of what I'm sharing with you now, and there's been some things since. It turns out you need to have a force of at least two times body weight for a, a peak. to get any meaningful changes going on in bone. And you need to have at least 100 repetitions of that per day. Um, it's OK if you miss a day once in a while. But regularly doing 100 reps or more of an activity that gives you at least two times body weight on how it loads you. So landing from a jump seems pretty good, right? It's getting up around five times body weight. Even taking off for Parker is well above two times body weight. What kind of people worry about their bone density most? <laughs> yeah, old, small women, yeah. Um, being heavy builds bones, because if you're walking around, that's going to be good. Um, but we usually don't worry until we know there's a problem. And that's when we're 70, 80 years old and have osteoporosis. Um, are they going to go do jumps like this? Definitely not landing with five times body weight. That might cause a fracture. So um, at that age, it, it starts becoming too late to do an exercise intervention to help with your bones. There can be some gradual adaptation and slowly building up, but um, it would take a very long time to overcome the troubles that are already there. So when you're young is when to build your bones up. Get them to a higher peak bone density before that gradual decline that goes from about age 25. Um, so standing doesn't get high enough, but taking off on a jump and landing is great for Parker. So you could do 100 vertical jumps a day. You'd have good, strong hips. It might not help you with your, uh, if you land and get a wrist fracture, but your hips would be very good and dense uh, if you do that 100 times a day. Um, do you enjoy doing vertical jump for your exercise? <laughs> it kind of get old, wouldn't it? Um, how about running? So hopefully running can get us above that. And then you get enough reps. You'd, you probably do more than 100 reps each time you go for a run. So we'll, we'll look at walking and running and see how that fits. So think about these magnitudes of forces and how they relate to the bone density. I'll give you a little bit of information from Dr. Snow as we finish up today. Um, that gives you some motivation on why you'd care about this when it doesn't seem to be a problem for you yet. Uh, one other piece, it's at least two times body weight, 100 reps a day or more, and it has to be a very rapid, they call it the rise rate, how quickly the force builds up. If you just had someone like this and you gradually put a, lot of, a load on their uh, shoulders to create two times body weight force throughout, it doesn't do anything for bone density. It has to be a, a rapid loading of the bone, or it doesn't respond the way you'd want it to. OK, so that's the vertical jump. One other thing that we can look at with this is both 
um, both legs together. If I can get the, there it is. Yeah, this is what it looks like left and right. And let's see which one's which. The, trying to figure out which plate is which. Number two is this one, which is the front of the treadmill. So your right leg is number two which is 836 there. Okay, the green is your right leg and the left is your red left leg. So it looks like your right leg likes to put more force in the takeoff and in the landing. Uh, when you start a race, which foot do you have forwards? Okay, that's opposite what I was guessing would happen. Maybe you were just leaned over a little when you jump, but we have our power leg and our, um, uh, I guess, non-powerful leg. There's a leg you prefer to jump off of. If you're jumping as high as you can or a long jump, then we usually jump off the power leg, which is usually the leg that's forward when you start a race. Um, so I was expecting it would be that way for uh, Parker, with more force being shown here on the right side. But one jump, maybe it's just a little different than expected there. Um, but uh, fairly symmetrical. The landing a little different, but um, usually they're not just both legs overlaid exactly the same. So one thing, benefit of the force plates, we can measure asymmetries and see what legs are doing different than another. Okay, Parker, let's have you do some walking now. And on this, um, try to keep the seam of the treadmill about at the middle of where you're walking. And we're going to three miles an hour, so just a comfortable walking speed. And ready, go. Okay. All right. We're just looking at the screen now. You can see the center of pressure, how that drifts across. Um, move a little further forward. Okay, that's good. All right, I'm going to collect a few seconds of data here. And I'm going to stop you. Three, two, one. Okay, let's open that trial. And we'll start with the vertical force again. This is what it looks like. Uh, in this case, we don't know which foot's left and right. Uh, sometimes the right foot was on plate two, and sometimes the left foot was. Um, I'm guessing plate two, the front one, is the green. So let's see. That means. A foot was touching the ground on the front plate right there, built up to a peak, then the force dropped a bit, and then it moved onto the back plate and built up to another peak. This middle section here, we'd actually add these two curves together. So if we just had one foot displayed, it would build up to a peak, drop down about here, build up to the second peak, and then this is where the foot comes off the ground and the other foot started hitting the ground. So that's what vertical force looks like in walking. You can see a lot of vibration here compared to the, uh, just the regular jump. Uh, treadmills are that way with force. You just get some what we call noise uh, from vibration or electrical interference, but we can still see the general shapes pretty well. Um, now, if we averaged the vertical force across 100 seconds of walking, what do you think it would be equal to? Over that 100 seconds, has he accelerated up or down on average, or just stayed the same? Yeah, it's not going to change. The, he's accelerating up and down when force goes above and then below body weight, but the average force 
all the way through, was it 570, I think we were saying, um, would be right along here if you average these forces all together. So if you have no overall acceleration up or down on average, then you've got force of the ground pushing up equal to the body weight pushing down. That'll fluctuate a little because as you walk, there's a little up and down movement going on. Uh, so that's the, the vertical force in walking. Is walking going to give you good improvements in bone density? Uh, we got up to a peak of about 700, so it's better than not doing anything. You know, just bed rest is where a lot of studies come from. Walking compared to best re bed rest is good. But if you're just doing activities of daily living, then you need something greater to see some improvements there on bone density. So going on a walk, better than nothing. There's other health benefits, but for bone, for people like you, it's not really going to give you any benefit. OK, now let's do running. And we'll look at the horizontal forces also with that one. So I'll have you go. Um, 10 minute mile pace at first, and then I'll jump you into six minute pace just for a, a little bit. <laughs> All right, so six miles per hour and ready. Oh, and mostly stay on the front belt for this. We have the two belt for walking so that when both feet are on the ground, we can still separate them um, mathematically. For running, it doesn't matter whether there's one or two. And there's a little noise as it transitions across the one belt to the other. So being more mostly on one will be a little benefit for us. OK, starting in three, two, one. OK, now I'm going to switch it to six minute pace. Three, two, one. OK, stopping in three, two, one. OK, good job, Parker. <laughs> Looks easy for you. <laughs> OK. He looks like he could go that six minute pace for more than the 10 seconds I required of him. That's, that's good. OK, for running, you are almost exclusively on the um, front belt. Here's the vertical force that we're seeing. So let's first look at the peak force. Uh, 1,500, six, so a little over 1,600 Newtons for peak force there. And it's a pretty quick, rapid rise. Uh, so running seems to be a good thing for bone density. And that's been proven many times for hip bone density. Uh, there's questions about spine bone density, how beneficial running is. But at least for the hips, it's great. Um, and even at 10 minute mile pace, it's, it's big enough to have a good benefit there. Um, notice, though, there's not, in walking, we had that build up to a peak, then the force dropped down. Because you hit the ground, heel first in walking, and it, you get bounced up a little bit, and the force drops below body weight. And then you settle in again and push off with the forefoot, and you get a shape that goes up, down, and up again. With running, it's just going up and down. So something definitely different has to do with the knee flexion, would be another part of it, comparing walking to running. And then we have the flight phase. Let me ask that same question. Over 100 seconds of running, what would the average vertical acceleration be? If you averaged the force all the way through this, including when it's zero, what do you think? the number would come to. Okay. Zero acceleration, 570 for body weight. Yeah, you can have someone come run on the treadmill, and without ever measuring their body weight the way we traditionally do, you just average 
a full step, like we could go from this point to this point, then average those numbers, we've got their body weight, assuming there wasn't any, over, um, as, assuming the average acceleration through that time is zero, which is pretty safe to say. All right, uh, the peak force was a little over 1,600 newtons there. Let's see what happens with faster running. Okay. We're, oh, here's a pretty high one. There's one, that's 1,900 there. The others are mostly above 17, 18, some of them. Okay, so larger peak force, I guess I sampled for a longer time. There's making it look a little more like what the other one, oh, on this screen. There's a little more what things look like for us. Okay, so here we have the flight time, a little bit of noise of the treadmill showing up, builds up to a new peak that's now greater. So if you run faster, you apply greater forces to the ground. You'd probably expect that. What would you guess is happening to the amount of time in contact with the ground when you run faster? Yeah, it's getting less. It's going to be shortened. Hard to tell here. We don't have a good way to display them overlaid so you could see the differences. But the force goes up, and the time on the ground goes down the faster you run. It has to. If, if, you, if your foot's attached to the ground and you're running faster, you, you just can't go. So you've got to have the, the foot keeping up with the rest of the body so it can't be on the ground for as long that requires a greater amount of force. You're still having to get the body from moving downwards to be moving upwards, so we need a force that um, is large enough to accelerate the body. These are probably about, let's see, maybe 0.15 or 0.16 seconds each time the foot's in contact with the ground. And he's got to change from going, usually it's about, um, one and a half miles per hour downwards to one and a half miles per hour upwards of the center of mass of the body in 15 hundredths of a second. So that takes a lot of force to do that. The biggest cost of energy for running is supporting your, those vertical forces, supporting your body weight or changing your mass from moving down to up with every step. Uh, takes about 60% of body weight, or 60% of your energy cost is in uh, the creating these vertical forces. Yeah? You said that um, this is basically, this is, on, this is the force on the legs, but how much does it carry through to the rest of the body? Like, oh, yeah. Less, less like um, yeah, there's going to be some sure. absorption of the, the shock throughout the body. So we have ways, when we um, see the fancy cameras, maybe they don't look fancy, but they cost a lot. Um, <laughs> they emit just off of the infrared spectrum, uh, and we put reflective markers on the body. I don't see any sitting out right now, but we put 36 reflective markers on the body that, um, that are, they call them retro-reflective. It's, I don't know who else does this. I just know of 3M. They create these reflective markers that only reflect light back to the source. So even though it's a sphere, if it hits the sphere right on the edge, the light bounces straight back, which I don't know how that works. But the, so the, the cameras see two-dimensional circles moving around with multiple cameras going. We can get 3D positioning of the body. With that, knowing where all the joint centers are and knowing the force on the ground, there's this messy math we can go through, or the computer does it for us usually, that gives us um, forces at each joint and moments at each joint, or torques at each joint. So we can get all that info, and it, it, it's hard to just say generally here's what happens as you work up the body. There's so many interactions of joints all through the spine and that, that it's not a simple question to say what happens at the feet compared to a shoulder or a, a hip or something. But we can pull the numbers out, though. That is something we can calculate. All right. Uh, let's take a look at the horizontal forces matched with that. 
The foot strike is right here, and this represents force pushing the body backwards, and then this is force pushing the body forwards. How do those areas compare? <laughs> they, yeah, well, it'll, when, when you're in that positive side is actually the braking, the way we have this set up. So that's going to be pushing the center of mass of the body backwards a little bit and then forwards a little bit. So we get, um, and the areas you said are about the same. That means he's maintaining his velocity. If one of these was larger than the other, then he's either speeding up or slowing down. And sometimes you see that on here. If they're drifting along the treadmill, then that'll show up. But yeah, with them being matched, we're going to do impulse in chapter four. And it, that's the force combined with the time. It's the product. So it is actually the area inside this curve. And when those match up, you're maintaining your velocity. If the braking is greater than the propulsion, then you're slowing down. All right. Parker, do you consider yourself a midfoot striker or a heel striker? Um, when I look at pictures, it looks like heel. So, but it doesn't necessarily feel like that, right? No, not really. Um, you're kind of in between, according to the forces. This little spike right here, we're seeing on some of the steps, usually it was just on, I don't know if it's left or right foot, but it was like every other one had one of these little spikes at the higher speed, but not the slower. At the slower, it was pretty smooth, which means at 10 minute pace, you're mostly just doing midfoot strike. At six minute pace, there's a little bit of a heel contact first. When the heel hits, being very firm and stiff, the heel hits down and bounces the body a little bit compared to landing more softly with uh, a midfoot. So you get a little bit of a bounce. We call it an impact peak um, as you transition up to the active peak, which is right in the middle of the foot contact. Uh, we see that shape with heel striking, and we don't see it with midfoot strike. It just gets smoothed out. Some people, it's very pronounced. On the, the last class we had, it was a very obvious heel strike on that in terms of the forces. And, and you could see it in the movement, too. So how, what percent of runners are heel strikers? Any guesses there? I had a roommate that was a midfoot striker. And one of our home evening sisters would make fun of him because she said it looked funny when he his heel never touched the ground, and she thought that was weird. So most people seem to be heel strikers. Anyone read studies or do any papers on that? It's around 75 to 80% of people that grew up with shoes are heel strikers. Um, so if most people are heel strikers, is that better? Or is midfoot better and the rest just haven't figured out how to run the other way? What have you heard in studies or online or anything? Yeah. I did a lot of minimalist running, but um, I, I heard that forefoot like, takes a lot of pressure off the knees, and then midfoot is sort of like an in-betweener, and then heel foot gets the most pressure and it's throughout the joints in the body. So I would think that yeah. like, midfoot to forefoot would be healthier. Right. That's what is a good train of thought. Um, the, we, we just had a conference where Irene Davis was the moderator for a session I was in. She's one that taught at Delaware, now she's at Harvard. And if you've heard of uh, the Barefoot Professor, Joe Lieberman, that's one that works with her. They, they have this lab where they do a lot of barefoot and minimalist studies on, on uh, running. And we were in a session and she said, or, after a couple of the posters had been presented and they were answering questions and that, I was thinking there's this big focus on less force seems to be what we want in terms of injury. And so I asked a question of, this was one where it's 
a session where you, someone presents a poster and then anyone asks questions about the topic and you just kind of have a big discussion. So I asked, what, uh, why do we want less force on the body? And um, we, we ended up with a pretty good discussion for a while on that idea that we probably want to get to optimal force. If we find ways to change our technique so that we're putting less force on the body, then you remember Wolf's Law? Have you learned that somewhere along the way? <laughs> you, you got a summary. What does it say? Loading, uh -huh. Yeah, it's the adaptation one. So the, the body adapts to the level of stress imposed on it, and the, the adaptation reflects the level of typical loading. So if we find ways to run with less force on our body, our body becomes weaker. And that was kind of the point when I asked the question. And uh, so we want uh, maybe more force in some time. Maybe that's a good thing, because then you get stronger tissues once you get used to handle those forces. But it has to be gradual either way. Yeah. Right. Versus if you have someone who's lighter, they have to be able to. Yeah, to that's an important it. point. Because everyone's built differently. And a, a question is, why are 20% or 25% doing midfoot and 80 are doing heel? It's because we're all different. So yeah, that's exactly right. Um, as, as we got through the discussion and talking to other people at this conference, we kind of narrowed in on everyone's different. We're built differently. We'll have different movements that are going to be optimal for our own bodies. But um, minimizing or maximizing force isn't necessarily the right choice here. It's optimizing force so we get good, strong tissues and have time to adapt to, to get those strong tissues. And then we can um, hopefully avoid injury because our tissues are stronger. And we've got techniques and footwear that hopefully um, help keep the right amounts of loading on the body. So, yeah. Well, also, I think it depends on what races or like yeah. speeds you want to run at. Right. Whole different question for performance versus injury. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's the other thing. So, with um, performance, uh, for, for injury, based, the summary of what we've learned is midfoot and heel strike, if you take all the studies that are done, there's no difference in occurrence of injury. Another one just recently came out from Irene's lab that um, had, I guess it wasn't midfoot necessarily, but it was barefoot and shoe wearers um, tracked over time, and they found no difference in incidence of injury. The barefoot were only running 20 miles a week, the others were doing 40, and the barefoot were mostly older people compared to the others. But with the groups they had, they found both get injured just as much as each other. And other studies have shown with different groups and populations and that, same thing with midfoot and heel. So injury, no difference in occurrence, but heel strikers tend to get injured at the knee and hip and midfoot below the knee. Uh, but the total number of injuries doesn't seem to change. Yeah. Um, there's still the, the braking and propulsion happens either way, except on the heel strike, you get this happening inside there also. But the braking and propulsion are the same. The difference is with midfoot running, you're, you spend um, a little bit more time on the ground, you have a smaller peak force, you have a shorter stride, to match the same speed. So it's a shorter stride with less force for a little bit longer time. So the rise of force is a little bit less also compared to the heel. And the way that stresses the foot and ankle is a little different than landing heel first, I guess. And on, on average, the midfoot strikers tend to get injured below the knee more frequently. Doesn't mean they won't get a hip injury and a heel striker can still get a fractured metatarsal or something. But on average, that's what is observed. 
So no difference in injury totals, but different locations are more frequent in one compared to the other. For performance, uh, it seems you get the same kind of result. When you look at economy of running or performance times, midfoot and heel strike, there seems to be no difference uh, across studies. Some say one's better than the other and the other way around also. Most are finding no real difference to be noticed. So mostly we just advise people what feels comfortable for you, that's what you should do. And then you're um, using less energy. If you try switching from what's unnatural, you usually end up using more energy. So do what feels natural, and that ends up being best for performance. Might not be best for injury, depending on what things you've gone through in your, your life. But so that, that's the one time I consider shifting from one foot strike to another, is if you've constantly got hip or knee troubles, switching to trying midfoot running on a soft surface might take some stress off there, but realizing it's going to add stress somewhere else, so you still need to be very careful and, and make good choices in that. So I guess the answer there and all of that is we don't really know a whole lot. <laughs> uh, there's not much difference between the two, but when you take an individual person, trying to change them from one to the other uh, can cause some problems. All right, uh, there's one other thing I want to mention on sprinting specifically, and then a bit with bone density, but any just general questions up through that point? All right, here we saw, let's see, at six minute pace, this was about three times body weight for the peak force. What do you think we'd say if we could, or see, if we could, if we had a fast enough treadmill, if we could bring a sane bolt in? have them go maximum speed, how much force would the peak come on him? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so when he's at top speed, no matter what distance, but at top speed, if we could capture that step of force, how high do you think it would get? If Parker's at three at a six minute pace. There's not. At least no one's run fast enough to find that. <laughs> and if he hasn't done it, uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, this doesn't go fast enough for you. Um, yeah, it goes up to eight. Eight times body weight. We haven't measured Usain, but um, Ralph Mann that I'll tell you about later, he's a graduate from here, studies sprinting and, and hurdling. He's measured some of our US athletes at above eight times body weight for the peak force in sprinting. But the time in contact decreases with the ground, right, the faster you run. So the, the challenge with sprinting now, we know we need huge forces. You, know, you can't get someone in a rate room and say, let's put seven times body weight on here, and you've got one times body weight, and do some quarter squats. Um, I don't think anyone could even stand that way. <laughs> um, well, even two times body weight on the bar, even with both legs, is more than most people can handle, right, for squats. So Usain somehow can do eight times body weight. The difference is it's for a few thousandths of a second that it gets up there. And he's building up to get that force using eccentric activation, which is stronger than concentric or more powerful. Uh, and he's incredibly powerful and strong. So we have uh, eight times body weight there on, on uh, our best sprinters in the world. They have less time to apply the force. So we tell them to run faster, you need to run, apply 8.1 times body weight. But if you're going to try to do that, it's going to happen in less time. So now you only have seven hundredths of a second to apply the, to be in contact with the ground instead of eight hundredths of a second. So there's this difficulty. How do we apply more force? when we've got even less time to do it. And so a lot of training in the last few years for sprinting has been going to a lot of uh, plyometric type activity, where you're hitting the ground and coming off as quick as you can, a lot of hopping, jumping, and things like that. So that's where we are with uh, running and forces. The thing to finish with for you today goes back to our discussion on bone density. Um, 
we've got jumping and landing from jumps especially. A lot of people that can't jump very high, we have them step onto a box and do drop landings to get enough force to build bone. 100 reps a day, not much fun. If you can find something else, it's better probably. Uh, so basketball, running in basketball, that's going to be good for you, right? There's a lot of jumping too. Volleyball, a lot of jumping there. Activities that include running, uh, doesn't have to be go out for a run, but they will build your bone density. And you get uh, at least two times body weight with, with every step once you're going about 10 minute mile pace or faster. You get a lot of repetitions. Uh, and uh, what was the other? Oh, walking isn't enough. Jumping is, especially landing and running is good. And activities that have those kind of forces are going to be good for you. Uh, when we tested the women's track team, a couple years after I got to BYU, we brought the whole team in and did bone density scans. Which athletes within track and field would have the best bone density, highest bone density? Distance runners were like normal people. They were right on average, but had a huge spread. Some were really high, because they do a lot of repetitions, and if their nutrition's good and hormones are right, then they'll have high bone density. A few didn't. We had one that had the bone density of an average 95-year-old woman, and she was anorexic, and uh, later on went on to med school. So did her husband. She also did a PhD with med school <laughs> on studying bone density. And a few years ago, I heard from her, and she's right on a normal person for her, her age and everything now. So she got through it. But um, they were really variable because of all the factors that go into that. Uh, so if not the distance runners, then who? Yeah, the jumpers in general. Yeah, we didn't have enough to say triple is better than long jump. But yeah, the jumpers were the highest. The throwers were next. Or no, that's not right. The um, hurdlers, sprint hurdlers were next. <laughs> Sprinting and hurdling is great. On, this, on the hurdlers, we even found uh, in the sprint hurdles, you always lead with the same leg. The lead leg was 10% more dense than the trail leg. And so it's very sensitive to how you load the body. And then the throwers were still quite high. Being heavy and doing a lot of explosive exercise, that's going to help for sure. So there's some stuff I've learned, hopefully applying it to stuff you might care about. Um, and now that you've seen some forces, when we meet on Wednesday, no class Monday, uh, when we meet Wednesday, we'll finish chapter one, and hopefully visualizing this will help you comprehend it a little better. Okay, if you didn't get one of the cards to fill out, um, they're around somewhere, just so I can learn who you are a little better. <laughs>